My thing was, if I'm going to tell the story, then I have to lay myself bare. I can't half-ass it. I can't, like, give you, like, a little window in. Like, I have to let you be there. And I have to allow myself to be that as vulnerable as I was living it. I have to bring that back to the page. And that wasn't always easy. You're listening to the MILF Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now here's your host, the MILFiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, sexuality, and everything in between. I'm Jennifer Tracy, your host. Back to my normal role this week of being the interviewer. I hope you guys really enjoyed the pod swap I did last week with Jackie McDougall and her 40 Thrive podcast. If you didn't get over to her podcast to check out the other half of that pod swap, please do. It was really fun. And I just love and adore her. Hi, episode 51. I mean, we're on the other side of 50 right now. We're over the hill, right? Wait, is the hill 40 or 50? I don't know. Anyway, (laughs) Really exciting guest on the show today. I can't wait to introduce her. But before I do, I'm going to make a few short announcements. Number one is just to remind you that the organization that I'm focusing on for June for the give is familiesbelongtogether.org. You can find their information on my website, milfpodcast.com and the giving back page, or you can go directly to them, uh, familiesbelongtogether.org and make a donation. As always, if you write an iTunes review for Milf Podcast in the month of June, I will donate $25 for each review written in the month of June for my podcast. So that's that. Check that out. Another thing is we have our live podcast event coming in July here in Los Angeles. We're going to do a live podcast event Wednesday, July 24th at Dynasty Typewriter Theater, which is in Los Angeles. It's about halfway between Koreatown and downtown in this beautiful, beautiful theater. I'm so excited that we get to do it there. And there's going to be some fun stuff happening that night, some fun surprises. Um, There's going to be some pole dancing There's going to be four beautiful women on stage with me um, that are going to be talking with me about sex after kids and just sex in general, but particularly like what happens after you have a child and how do you have sex? Do you have sex? Do you want to have sex? All of those things. So, um, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the guests. I haven't revealed who any of the guests are until today. So I'm going to reveal three of them, but the last one is going to remain a mystery for a couple more weeks. So um, the first guest that's going to be in the live podcast event is Sabrina Hill Weiss, Sabrina Hill Weiss, who was my very first guest on the show. She was on episode one. She's also one of my best friends. She's such a MILF and she's just delightful. And Sabrina and I have known each other for, gosh, now 16 years and we performed sketch comedy together for years and years and years. And um, she's a delight. She's also does the opening titles for the show. She does the announcing and announces me and that's her beautiful voice. The second guest is going to be Wendy Miller. Wendy was recently on the show. She was episode 43. She was the head of programming for Playboy TV for seven years and she is a sexologist. So She's going to definitely have quite a lot to add to our conversation about sex after kids and just sex in general. And the third person I'm going to reveal is the beautiful Christina Grants, who was in episode eight of the show. She has her own, she has a little boy who's almost two, so she's really in the thick of it. (laughs) Um, And she also has her own lingerie um, business. So online lingerie business, and she's killing it in all in all areas. So she's going to be on stage as well. Anyway, that was just a little reveal of that. If you want to get tickets for the show, which I highly recommend doing ahead of time, you can go to my website, milfpodcast.com. Under the events page, there's a link to buy tickets, or you can go to the Dynasty Typewriter website and buy them there. Again, it's Wednesday, July 24th. I hope to see you there. Today's guest is Tembi Locke author of the memoir, From Scratch, 
this book literally ripped me apart and then put me back together again. I was so blown away. I didn't actually want the book to end. I kept kind of drawing out, finishing it. I would look at it and go, God, I really want to read that, but I'm, I don't want it to end. So I would let it sit for a couple days. Honestly, one of the best books I've ever read. Top five books I've ever read. I, I just, and I obviously don't say that very often. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Reese Witherspoon actually picked it um, last month as her book of the month for her book club. And um, Tempe's been on this amazing book tour because it was just released last month. And so I've been watching her just really shine and go and, and do cooking events and book signings. And it's just so amazing. And when I got to come to her house, go to her house um, and meet her, we had never actually met. A mutual friend hooked us up. It was just like instant love. Like we just, we just, well, I'll speak for myself. I fell in love with her. The interview definitely demonstrates that. And it's, uh, anyway, I really hope you enjoy my interview with Tembi. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, Tembi. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being on the show. You have no idea how thrilled I am. This is really such an honor. I have so many things I want to talk to you about that we're not going to get all of it in, but uh, we'll get a good, solid, juicy, at least 45 Let's minutes of it. Let's do it. Let's so, do it. I'm in the middle of reading your book. Okay. And I was just telling Corinne this last night, our mutual dear friend. Yes. It is one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. Literally. I can't put it down the way I'm totally with you. And what struck me, and I was thinking of this this morning as I was reading it, what I love most about it, one of the many things, is that I am experiencing, I'm going to get emotional. I should have brought tissues with me. I have so. Um, that I'm experiencing you fall in love with your husband over and over and over again. Yeah. And it's exquisite. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's hopeful you know, just of life and love and like the world. And it's just, uh, it's, it's just exquisite. I'm so, I'm so excited to sit and talk with you and I want to like learn more about you. And thank you. <laughs> I, you know, that it's, that lands so deeply in my heart. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a first time writer. And so I didn't come to writing about my life from the sense of I have an MFA or I've wanted to do this my whole life. No. I had a story that I felt if I didn't get it out of me and share it, that I would suffer another kind of grief mm. when I sat down to write it. And maybe I'm jumping ahead. I don't know. No, you, but, there's, no, <laughs> okay. there's no order. But yeah. when I did, when I sat, when I began in earnest, when I really knew like, okay, no, this is a book and I feel like I should tell it this way. And um, one of the things that, I did was I wrote um, a letter to myself. And the letter, um, I don't have it in front of me, but effectively what it said was, you know, let this book, this endeavor, this project that I'm embarking on, let it touch as many hearts as it possibly can. And if I've done that, then I've served the larger cause. Mm. And I think, um, so whenever I would get stuck in the writing or when I would be hard, I would come back to the letter that I wrote to myself as a reminder that it's, um, I could bring to it the best that I could with the skill set that I have, but just anchor it in a heart place mm -hmm. so that when you as a reader share that or, or give me that feedback, I know that I feel like that wish was fulfilled yeah. in terms of, you know, the the heartfelt intention behind the writing. Yes. Well, and it's so, it's interesting that you bring that up. I have my students do that as an exercise. Um, I have them write a letter. As a published author, I have them write a letter to their current self. That is fantastic. From that perspective. So okay. it's a very, not dissimilar to what yeah. you're saying, which is yeah. because it is so hard to write a book. I mean, it is just so hard to write a book, and we're going to get into that in a minute. But um, to have that staying power and, you know, what you talk so beautifully about throughout the book and in your TED Talk, which I also enjoyed, which is that depth of unconditional love and connection, you know, that is present and that has within you grown because of, not despite of, this. Yes. Exactly. Incomprehensible loss. Exactly. Exactly. And that, yes. And that is something that is a, you know, it took me, it has taken me 
No problem. We get a we'll just pause for it. Yeah. This, Real life happens. That's how analog I am. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I have I love a plan it. it's, a, it's actually kind of comforting. Well, well, you know why I keep it? And okay. So because no one calls 911. You're supposed to do it for that. I, I actually keep that line for my mother in law. Oh. So she doesn't like calling on cell phones. There are. For one, I think she has a hard time getting through sometimes for whatever reason, c- right. calling. It's just, <clears throat> ch- so she just, it's familiar. She's used that number for, you know, 20 yeah. years. She yeah. likes it. Yeah. And she can leave a message yeah. and it, it's great. She gets a little, like when she hears the cell phone, you know, so anyway, so I leave it for her. That's precious. I leave the phone for her and it's like her and solicitors. Those are only two people Hilarious. Calling. Anyway. I love it. So, um... When did you know, uh, we're going to go into the book and like how that was birthed. And because when you say it, I mean, it blows my mind to hear you say the words, I'm a first time writer, but I really want my listeners to hear this because I always tell people you're an innate storyteller. Like we all are like we're raised hearing stories, telling stories. It's how we make sense of the world. And you came in knowing that you wanted to be an actress. Yes. So you were just like, you knew that you were a storyteller from yes. day one. Yes. And so the fact that you were like, I've never written a book. I have that cookbook plenty. Oh my God, it's so good. It's so it's such a good one. delicious. God, that, you have a meat. Of course you have amazing well, cookbooks. Well, some are, some are Sato's, some are mine. Um, some, I I have a kind of weakness for the, you know, the printed word. And I like, yeah, a, I like books I around me and cookbooks are like, oh. Yeah. And I want to like touch the pictures mm-hmm. and get sauce on them. And Absolutely. I love doing that. So sorry, I have a little bit of ADD, and you'll notice that throughout the conversation. Um, so Bring the it. fact that you, the I love it. Thing. Bring it. I love it. Well, I I laugh because you know everybody in my family knows that like if if you can say something in five words, I'll say it in fifty. <laughs> like in spe- in speaking. So uh, the fact that I'm doing a podcast, I'll be happy if we get through all your questions. <laughs> Hilarious. I'm the same way, girl. So this will be a feat for both of us. <laughs> when did you come up with the concept for this book? So mm. your husband died in 2012. Yes. And how long after that did you realize, I want to write a book, I need to write a book? So I'll back up a little Please. bit. Okay. So the genesis of me beginning to write actually happened after he was initially diagnosed. So not like maybe two years or so after he passed, and I was a new mother. Oh. So you can imagine being a caregiver and a mother to, you know, a, a newborn, a baby, yeah. I was kind of, so much was coming at me. I was like facing these two different sort of junctures in life, one caring for an ailing partner, husband, lover, and then also being mom to baby. So did you I, have any help? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Did um, you have assistance you know of any kind, help? Like, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> that <please>. noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I had family who would pitch in here and there. And for a period of time, we did, we blessed ourselves with um, someone who came a nanny, you know, which sounds like a very formal, but, but, you know, it was basically, yeah, we we found each other on Craigslist. She came, you know, three days a week for three hours. And that was, that was helpful. Right. And so in that time, creative part of me inside felt that I didn't have a place to express what all that I was happening. And I couldn't, I didn't feel, and I was still acting, but you know, it, you know, acting is, you know, it's hit and miss. It's it's based on other people's timelines and auditions and 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 when you book something. And so I needed something that I could come to creatively and just write. And I was doing it initially just to make sense of my lived experience, mm-hmm. you know. And um, so I took writing classes at UCLA, mostly, um, I took some on campus, but mostly online because I could, you know, if I was sleepless, I could write it to in the morning. And I kind of just did that off and on for, I don't know, six, seven years. Wow. With the idea at one point, I thought, maybe I'll write a book about caregiving. But it was not the time. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite wrap my mind around it, but I kept loving the, the journey of writing. And so I kept taking classes. And then after Sato passed, um, I felt like, okay, I think I want to write a book. But I didn't know what that would look like. I didn't know where it would begin. I didn't know what it would encompass. I mean, I knew it would be at the root about our love, but I said, well, now I'm grieving. So how do I escort that? You know, I didn't know where do I 
where do I begin the story? Where do I end the story? Sure. What's the, you know, and I needed to sit with that. So that kind of just hung out incubating in my imagination for a year, for like three years. Yeah. Right? So th three years after he passed, I felt, okay, I'm ready in earnest to really begin thinking about a book proposal, like thinking how I would actually structure this. Yeah. Because at some point I'm going to want to do this. And I continue to take workshops. Yeah. Um, still not really ready, not quite sure, you know. Um, and you're raising a daughter. And I'm raising a daughter. Solo. And I'm still yeah. in the lived experience. And so it was really the one of the summers that I was in Sicily. And I looked around and, you know, I thought, oh, I've had three summers here after Sato's passing. I looked at my daughter, I looked at my mother-in-law, and I looked at me, and I literally had a question, how did we get here? Mm. And that question became the book. Ah. I needed to answer that, and I thought that's something I would want to answer in a book for myself, for a reader, and also for my daughter to have a story. Like, she takes for granted, this just happens every <laughs> summer, we right. go see her grandmother in Sicily. And I knew that there were parts of her dad's life that she didn't know, and I wanted to be able to share them. And she was always asking me, tell me a story about Babu. Tell me a story about Babu. And, you know, there were some I can tell and some that were not age appropriate to tell. <laughs> <So> <laughs> right. I didn't tell those. Um, but the book, that's when, so three years after his passing is when I really began to think about a book. Mm. And I kind of then tink continued to tinker and write and tinker and write and shape sort of how I would think of you know, my thinking of the book. And really, as I approached his fifth anniversary, that's when I was ready to, you know, I think I can curse on a podcast. Oh, fuck okay. yeah, you can. Great. Yeah. I was ready to shit or get off the pot, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Yeah. And, um, and I think there's something for about grief and loss that five years is a really, it's a significant marker of time. And I felt that I'd had enough l experience after his passing to sort of, and I was solid enough in my life to be able to look back. Right. And to also be able to share. I had done enough making sense you know, of some of the early parts. I had to heal, basically. I mean, yeah. when you have to, I needed to heal. I couldn't like jump in and be like, hey, let me start writing a book. Yeah. Now, I was raw. I was great. You know, I sure. could, if anything, I wrote tons of letters to people, like just thanking them, complaining. I mean, I, yeah. you know, my writing it was very raw initially, yeah. right? Therapeutic. Therapeutic. It's, yeah. And it's, it's, you need to sort of make sense before you can share. Yes. Yes. And the memoir, I mean, at the crux of memoir is being able to have lived enough and made sense of it enough to then go share. So right. at any juncture before that five year, I just wasn't ready. Right. Um, I wasn't ready emotionally, but also I hadn't had enough l of the living to tell right. the story I wanted to tell. Right. You know, and make sense of and it make sense in a of different it. way. And make sense of it yeah. in a very in a very different way. And I'd had someone tell me one time I was working on a project and I was working in Vancouver. And I was on the plane back with one of the writers on the show. And at that point, so Sada was still alive. This was probably like two years before he passed. And she was just chatting me up. And she and I said, you know, I'm writing. She goes, oh, you're writing? Because I was, you know, acting yeah. on her show. Yeah. And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh. She, goes, she said, well, what are you writing? And I kind of shared with her. And she goes, oh. She goes, well, this is my advice to you. Keep writing. And she said, and write down exactly what you're exper experiencing right now because it will never be as fresh to you again. Mm. So keep writing that. You'll know when you're ready. And that conversation stayed with me. Paula, you, wherever you are out there in the world, that's you I that I'm talking that. about. And Paula's advice became really critical when after, you know, at the five-year mark, when I was ready to go back and write a book, all that writing that I had been doing two years before he passed when he was critically ill and in the hospital or, you know, you know, the six months after m month after he passed, all of that, I had this sort of document of wow. my lived experience that I could go back to. So, you know, I think Joan Didion talks about keeping journals, yeah. you know, keeping a notebook, yeah, all of that stuff. That became really key. And I can say this having just freshly closed the book before I got in my car to come over here. I'm in the middle, I'm in the middle of the book right now, is that I can feel that just in the texture of the book and the words and the descriptives, like the way that you describe each scene and each moment and each place, it's, I really feel like I'm there with you. 
because the details are there. It's Thank so you. specific. Thank you. So that is such a great, that's so interesting that you had all the documentation. How did you decide? Because the book goes back and forth in time, yeah. which I love. Okay. Thank I love you. that. Oh, I, I love everything about it. <laughs> I was scared it. of that. I have to be honest right, with right. you. Right. It's because it can be scary. Yeah. And some writing, air, I'm air quoting experts, mm -hmm. will say, oh, don't do that or don't do flashbacks or whatever. And I always say, don't listen to anybody who calls themselves an expert. <laughs> like, well, and also just like you have to tell the story in the way that you want. And like for me, well, anyway, so how did you decide how to do that? And then how on earth did you figure out how to, because it is seamless. There's no, I don't stop and go, wait, where are we? I just go, oh yeah, we're here. Oh, now we're here in Sicily again. And it's this time. There's no pause in me that goes, where are we? That I have to say, I mean, I can talk on a very practical level and then I have to get a little woo-woo. All of it. Yeah, because, all of it. Because some of it happens in a woo-woo space. <laughs> yes. I'm very woo-woo. Sort of, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so... I always knew that for me, I don't think linearly. My experience as a grieving person, there's nothing linear about that. Yeah. I would come down the stairs in 2013, round a corner, and, oh, there's something that reminds me of 2006. And, oh, there's my child, and she's wearing the same sweater. She, You know, memory doesn't work in a linear fashion. So yeah. I knew that because the book was about loss and memory— that to just go and then A and then B and then C and then D was, first of all, boring as a bag of tacks. Yeah. And C <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else when you said bag of. I was like, oh. Oh, oh no. We're getting there. We're warming up. We're warming up. Um, no, but I just, it it doesn't, so it would have felt inauthentic and it wasn't a book I would, I could write or a book I was interested or even would know how to write. Yeah. Now, that said, when So I knew I wanted to sort of be mosaic yeah. in my approach. I wanted it to feel the way it feels in my body and in my heart and in my memory. But then there's another, so that's my desire. That was my wish, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And then there's the rendering. Yeah. Like, okay, so now how do I technically do that in I mean, a narrative that is form? a very advanced, you know, writing style and writing uh, structure and... Well, I it, it it yes and you and, did. I, and it scared me it scared sure. the bejesus it would out of scare me. me and by the way there were many um when the when I so I wrote the I wrote the proposal and the book I got the book deal off of the proposal wow. and one of the things that came back the some of the feedback I, I came back as I was talking to editors was some people were like Shh, oh she's a first time writer nope she needs to tell this in a straight line Interesting. That's like, interesting. You need to, this is this is too complicated. Like, what if you get lost? What if she just gets lost in the middle of the narrative somewhere and you can't track it? And I was sort of like, I heard it, but I also was like, Yeah, no, I think I can do this. Yeah, I think I can do yeah. this. I think I can. I think I can do this. I don't know how yet, but I know I can do this. The editor that I ended up working with, she also saw the same vision. She mm. liked the idea of. So because I know that I'm taking my reader effectively through, I mean, the book kind of touches on three decades, yeah. you know, touches on the 90s, you know, the 2000s, and then, you know, the 2000s, you know, current, yeah. current, current yeah. decade. So, and then it's in five locations, it's in three languages, yeah. you know, I was like, okay, so I'm taking the reader across a lot of terrain. Yeah. I'm asking a lot of them. So I need to anchor it in a very specific structure. So I felt like the three summers structure would give the reader an anchoring, like, mm. and that also, you know, my, you know, high school English, the three act structure, you know, yes. beginning, a middle, and yes. an end, yes. right? Gives, gave me some guardrails. Yes. Right? So I couldn't just kind of go off. I needed to sort of, but then I was always touching back in time. Yes. Within that time frame. So initially, I, um, my first draft, my full completed first draft, was not the what you are reading, the kind of reading right now. It had everything in it, but there was a lot more, and it, things were in different orders. Sure. Um, and the process of, well, let me back up and say that initially, what I did when I began was I created an outline for myself. So I wrote for myself a timeline of my own life. 
Then in my totally, you know, OCD, anal, and totally scared that I could not execute the very thing I told these people I would execute, I thought, okay. I then, so I created like almost a grid. So I did a timeline and then I did A, B, and C stories. And that's from my work as an actor in Hollywood, right? Where you have like your A story, which is driving, you know, the episode, then you've got your B story, and then you've got your, your lesser story. So I was like, okay. What is driving the narrative? Yeah. You know, what is my B story that I'm constantly is there and I need to touch back to? Yes. What are those themes? And then what are the other things that I need to just do to round out? So I kind of created a chart for myself, a theme chart. (laughs) So it was so, I had to go back to the basics, like the basics. And I took the first month of my book deal and just organized my story. Yes. Uh, Before I could even get to the actual, I needed a, a big, a start. I needed to know where I was headed. Yes. And I knew that. And initially, the first chapters in my writing, I would sort of like be in Sicily, and then I would touch back to a memory in LA, and be in Sicily and touch back to a memory in LA. And I was always concerned that maybe I would lose my reader. Um, And in that first draft, sometimes it did. (laughs) But I needed to do it that way first. Yes. And then in my second draft, or the second draft I gave my editor, let me put it like that. (laughs) Because there were many drafts before the one that I gave my editor. Right. Um, Then we kind of really looked at it. And and then it became like making the mosaic even more mosaic. Mm. So I always knew I was starting on that mountaintop in Sicily. Mm. And I always knew, you haven't gotten to the end, but I always knew where I would end. I won't give it away. <laughs> I always knew where I would end, yeah. right? And I knew I had my three summers. Mm. And I knew I needed to anchor the reader very early on in the love and in the loss. So that they were emotionally hooked in and that they knew Sado. So I have to bring effectively as a writer my job. So I I looked at this book on two levels. One, what I'm doing as like the wife with like, like my lived experience of it. But then there's the what my writer has to do mm. to tell the st- emotional story. Yes. So I needed to bring Sado to life. You're the auteur and you're also the central protagonist, literally. And I mean, just again, like, and I texted this to Corinne. I said, she, I was, I was done. I was like hook, line and sinker from the prologue. That prologue I worked on for a very long, years. I mean, y- y- I say that, and I mean, I, I wasn't at it every day for a year, right. but like I would write a section of it, and they're like, oh, oh, okay, hold on to that. Yeah. That that lives somewhere in the book. And then something else would come to me. I'd be like, oh, huh. okay, I'll put a pin in that. Yeah. And then I would categorize, it's just like so getting crafty here. Our oh, discussion. no, I love it. I love like it. Organ- I mean, like, this is my life. <laughs> okay, so, okay, yeah. so perfect. I, I can like, because I'm, I'm learning it too. And I, and I don't know that, you know, if, should I write another book if I'll use the same process? But what I did was I was like, oh, any, I um, created folders for myself. First, I did them actually physical. Like I went and staples hard on oh, the paper. I'm, you, you, pa- well, you'll yeah. come over to my house. It is bulletin boards and yeah. pit, like I have like 80 <laughs> different colors of <laughs> colored pens, little note cards, giant post-its, baby post-its. Listen, I have to see it. I'm uh, visual. I have to see, I'm a visual. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I love it. Staples, yeah. folders. I drive a hybrid vehicle, so I'm getting the planet back. It's a net neutral. Somewhere in there, it's a net neutral. I hope. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I create, and so the, I categorized them thematically, right? So I'd looked at, so all the years that I was sort of germinating ideas, if I, if something would spark for me, I'd write it, and then I'd pop it in that folder. Like, so Sicily's first summer. Oh, I just wrote a whole thing about plums. <laughs> okay, go in the food folder. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, some of the writings about my letters to Sato and after he passed and that, you know, f- missing him, that goes in another folder. So I kind of knew that somewhere in all those folders was a complete story. Yeah. And that prologue, I thought, oh, this feels like it could be the beginning. So every time I'd write something that felt like it could fit into the prologue, I put it in that, pr- what I would call the prologue folder. And, um, and that prologue, you know, it was really even hard for me. It was hard to write it. And I would have to step away and come back and step away and come back. When I had to recently reread it for the audiobook. Oh my gosh. Mm. So um, because I l- lived it and it takes me right back there in all the ways. And I wanted the reader right away to know I had I didn't, I didn't, I wanted them to 
feel Sato as immediately as he, as he landed in my heart. Mm. And so I thought, like, I have to have a sense of that kind of emotional urgency. Those were sort of my desires as I went to write the prologue. Mm. Like, the prologue has to do a lot in this book. Because I knew I was writing a book about loss, mm. right? And so, you know, it's one of those things where societally we want to shut down around. We don't, you know, it's hard to think about Absolutely. those things to begin with. Yeah. So I knew to pull a reader in, I needed to give them almost everything up front, mm. like from an emotional point of view. Mm. The love of it, the sex, the sexiness of it, the food piece, the sights and sounds of Sicily, as well as the pain. Mm. And put that there, and and um, yeah, that's, and you did oh, absolutely you. exquisitely. I mean, I just my jaw was on the floor after the prologue. I was like, because Corinne was like, "Have you started the book? What do you think?" I was like, "I haven't started yet, but I'll let you know." <laughs> and I read the prologue, and I texted her like, because she had also read it. Mm -hmm. We both were fortunate enough to get pre copies, and. I said, I'm just blown away. And then I would text her after a couple chapters. I'm like, are you kidding me with this book? Are you kidding me with this book? I'd send her a picture of me reading the book. Like, <laughs> it, it, seriously, and I'm, I'm not, and I don't do this often, but Thank you I'm gushing so because it's genuine. Like, this is, this is why we tell story. It is why we tell story. And I thought if I, if, you know, my thing was, if I'm going to tell the story, then I have to lay myself bare. Yeah. And I can't, I can't half-ass it. I can't like give you like a little window in. Like I have to let you be there. And I have to allow myself to be that as as vulnerable as I was living it. I have mm. to bring that back to the page. And that wasn't always easy. Mm. But um that was, you know, in that part of that desire I mentioned earlier about yes. the letter I wrote to myself is that that's the gift potentially you know, after Sato passed, someone um, said to me, you two, there's still more you have to do, the two of you. And by the way, how beautiful was that for someone to say to a newly grieving mm. partner, lover, spouse of someone? Mm. And I couldn't understand the words. They didn't actually, they were, they didn't cognitively make sense. I mean, I, you know, intellectually, I, I, they all lined up. They made, they were yeah. a complete sentence, yeah. <laughs> but I could not understand the meaning of what she was saying, yeah. but I, it, I couldn't unring the bell also. Mm. So fast forward five years and I'm ready to begin writing the book. I was like, maybe this is some of that. Yeah. So yeah, that's my and esoteric. So <laughs> much. I love it. And so much legacy. Yeah. For your daughter, if she has children yeah. for them. Like, I mean, which she is there definitely like, um, no, I'm not having kids. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> really? What does this mean? Really? No. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> Hilarious. No, I mean, she'll change her mind. But she, you know. No, I want to ask you a question about yeah. that. Yeah. Because oftentimes memoirists at the beginning of the journey say, oh, it's going to be about my family and they're going to read it. And oh, blah, hell yeah. And my advice always is write as if they are dead, <laughs> which in your case, <laughs> yeah, for, for one, one party of it. it yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah, literally, because, you know, again, like you can't hold anything back if you want it to be that as so rich. And, but so how did you deal with that? Did you have any feelings of <laughs> like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. how did you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, it did. Yep, it did. Yep. Yippers. Because you talk about your parents, you talk oh, about your in-laws, you talk oh, and every extremely vulnerable. And, and yes. yeah. So, so I, okay. <laughs> so, oh gosh. I, I yeah. <laughs> okay. So I knew that we would all have to be in the room and in the story. Yeah. And I very much knew I was not in any way interested in writing a takedown book about this. That's not what this right. is. This, right. so, not, so I already knew that you know my starting point was wasn't i need to reveal this person's secret right. right if anything i'm revealing my own secrets about some parts of me that i am still learning and discovering right i decided that i just need to write it but every day i was like oh my god i have to get to that part of it you know right. so it wasn't easy for me internally but i didn't let that stop me from mm. the writing then i thought well let me write it first you know, and then I can always pull back. I can always take away. I can always edit. But I need to not put a harness on myself at the starting gate. Right. I need to see what is seeking to be expressed. Mm -hmm. Right. So the only way to follow that is to actually allow it to unfold organically. 
and then see if it actually fits. So there are things that I wrote that were did not make the book, right? right? Because ultimately, when I went through the process of writing everything about everyone and, you know, different time and different also at different places in our lives, right? So where, where you meet someone in like the early 90s, they may not be there emotionally yeah. or intellectually or anything at the end of the book, right? Yeah. They've gone on their own journey. So I tried to also give everyone a journey and an arc. Yeah, You know, people get to go on arcs with yeah. me. Because I think that's a part of this whole, you know, someone recently said, it's like a, it's like a journey of a whole family you yes. know, of, of people. Yes. And we all kind of went on this journey together. And so, um, yeah, I, I definitely thought about it. And then when I finished the draft and I knew I had something that I felt like, okay, this is what's close to, is, you know, going to be shared with the world. Then I let certain people read it early. Okay. okay. And if there was something that stood out for them. Or that they, we could then, they could, they were free to share that with me. Uh -huh. it, I didn't say I'll take it out. Right. But I did want to at least give a heads up. There were some people that I just told them, like a section. I'd be like, just send them just a little excerpt. And I said, oh, this pops up here. What do you think? You know, is there anything you want to, you know, offer that? And then for my in-laws who are in Italy, who do not read English right. or speak English, for them, I simply told them that I am writing a book and this is the this is what the book is. This is its intent. It encompasses this. And really the what my hope and desire at the end of the book is that it be a kind of love letter to the fact that we're all sitting here right now in Sicily mm. having pizza. Mm. So I kind of tried to assure them that although I might be going into some of the parts that maybe we don't want to revisit, you yeah. know, as a family, yeah. but I, I owe it, I have to, that's a part of the story. I can't excise that yeah. from the story. Yeah. You know. Um, and what was their reaction when you called they, them and told them that? Well, I was actually we're present. And I did it in person. Oh, you, oh, you did it I in did person. it in person. Wow. I did it in person because I needed to sort of have, I'm big on transparency and accountability. Yeah. So I thought, I can't, I can't be responsible for how you feel. But I am responsible for telling you ahead of time, yeah, right, yeah. and sharing with you ahead of time. And I want to gauge a little bit, so I, it felt important to me to do it in person. Yeah. So um, they were like, "That's interesting. Good." They were like, "Okay, yeah," and they oh. kind of were on board with it. And then, and I was worried, you know, because yeah. I don't know, you know, everyone's people are private. And sure, sure. Um, I I wouldn't, you know, I've I haven't been a character in anybody's book, right? <laughs> Me neither. I don't know yeah. that I would want to. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, I guess I am because I wrote my own book, but you know what I mean, right? Um, Previous so, to that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my this with my daughter, I very as a mom, you know, I'm 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 writing about parts of her, yeah, early childhood, you know, um, I'm writing about her origin story. I'm writing about, you know, so it's, it's, I have to, I, I have a responsibility both as a writer and storyteller, but I also, I have a responsibility as her mom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, I'm not about creating something that, you know, later she's going to be like, now she might be like, what the fuck, mom? Right. Right. I, let's, let's just be, let's speak plainly <laughs> here. She might be like, what the fuck have you done? You know, we may have that conversation down the line, but I, my desire, my hope, is that she will look back on this or this book will be a part of her life going forward and she'll integrate it as she will over time and decades at different stages of her life. Yes. And maybe there's some parts of her early seven, eight, nine-year-old self that will be, you know, again, this is my take on her. This is her experience through my lens. Yes. Right? Yes. But I was also aware that, you know, for her... Some of those memories, you know, I don't have a lot of memories from when I was nine and seven. Yeah. I mean, I have some, I have yeah. some key ones, you know, yeah. so nobody wrote a book about what I was doing when I was seven or eight years old. Right. So maybe she'll appreciate that. Yeah. That's my plug. I hope. Oh, she, I, I mean, <laughs> I haven't met her. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting mm -hmm. her, but. She's quite exceptional. I, I mean, she's, duh. She's fun. Look at her parents. Like, she's hello. Fun. She's oh, that's fun. so awesome. Yeah. Um, But I can imagine like, you know. Again, just it's that amazing legacy of 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 having having that. Like again, and who was no one was writing about you, but like how neat to have that beautiful tapestry and mosaic of your parents' love. And and not a lot of people can say, Wow, my parents were like crazy in love. Yeah. And you guys were. Yeah, we were and still are. Yeah. Stupidly. Crazy in love. I mean, 
so many, and that's what I mean by the details. And and I know, you know, some of the listeners will have pre-ordered your book and have it. Some will be going out and rushing off to Amazon to Please order do. it right now. Um, we're going to have links to everything Great, in the show notes, you. and we're going to talk about all that as well. Oh, just the details of like, I'm thinking of the moment in the prologue where you have the ashes in between your thighs, and it's a hot, it's hot in Sicily, and you pull them out and and I mean, I still can see the scene almost as if I'm in the car next to you and you say it left a mark on the fleshy part of my thigh. Like, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously doing a terrible job, but Sato's pa- favorite part of my body. And I was like, <gasps> oh my God, he loved her so much. Like, and it's just so like, we all want that love and to be a witness at in the in the book like i'm i'm literally inside the book with you guys i don't know it's just it's so freaking awesome it was yeah you know sato was exceptional in his i don't know he was just incarnated in this time for that kind of heart love i mean like i was not i mean i have a capacity for i you know i i, I can see that now yeah but i have to say he really i he was my teacher. Uh, he was my teacher. And um, he taught me many things, you know, and I, some things have to do with the kitchen and food, some things about like, sort of like your take on life and the world, but it was also just that capacity for love and that unwavering sense. I mean, I didn't know that was possible. I mm. didn't think of, I, you know, but he just brought it and he wasn't, he didn't do anything sort of halfway yeah. when it came to affairs of the heart. Mm. He was an all in kind of person. And um, so you can imagine after he passed away, that sense of like, oh my God, it was like, it was like not only that the air had been sucked out of the room, it was like, it was like the whole, pl- like every every cell on the planet felt rearranged yeah. in some way, you yeah. know, like, it, it, and, and, and I remember asking my sister, you know, in a moment of desperation, I said, what do I do with all of this? And what I meant was, one, what do I do with, you know, in part, everything I'd learned in 10 years as his caregiver, right, through his yes. illness, because that's a certain skill set, right? And I didn't know where to put those last 10 years of my life. But then it was the bigger question was, what do I do with all this love? Like all this love that he gave me, left me, taught me, showed me, where does all that just go? Where does it go? What do you, what do I? And that was a question that just, it gnawed at me and not that it had to have an answer. There was no answer for it, right? And in some ways, maybe my attempts to write the book was in some ways my attempt to try to answer this where does the love go? Which some people might ask is like, where do we go when we pass? You know, where do we know all of that? But for me, it was like, what does this love, does it, do you die? Does it, I, I, it was just vexing, you know, and, and for a, a big primary loss, like losing your mm. lover and spouse. And I know every, you know, every, every widowed person, every loss is unique and personal, but losing Sato because of who he was, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the kind of relationship he, we had. And yes, that moment in the prologue, um, that was one of the, that was, when I lived that, that was one of the hardest moments, but it was also like so clear because he had asked me to do this thing. So as hard as it was for me, I think my cat just farted. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I... I didn't think I could love you anymore. And in this <laughs> moment, like, I, like, oh, I was, my God. <laughs> well, that's the okay. Now I you, love you so much. I'm sorry. I think I'm so sorry that you're in my home right now. And we are subject to this. May I crack a window? Okay. You can. You can. But I don't smell anything because okay, my okay. nose is stuffed up. Okay. Well, then we're fine. But I, I, I need suffer. to share with you. Yes. And we'll get back to the prologue. And you're like, it was the most difficult thing I've ever. My cat just farted. That was like, I couldn't write that. That's better. my life. So, um, I had an interview recently where the woman, um, Andrea Abbott, who's amazing, had four dogs, and one of the dogs is very old and was under the piano sleeping, and she was just farting the whole time. Horrible. 
and there's Turn nothing the like air an old dog. purple dog no, no, no. fart. There's <laughs> nothing. There's nothing on the planet so like an old dog. So we spun it, and we were like, you know what? It's good for your skin. In fact, we're going to open a fart facial pop up in the Brentwood Village. <laughs> oh my god, That's we went all the way with no, it. You have to because it's just part of life. Oh it's my, like it is. you know, it and is. the cat parts that happen. Yeah, You're awesome. so adorable. You were saying about the prologue that you lived it, and he had asked you to do this thing, which I wanted to interject and just say for our listeners who haven't had the pleasure of reading the book yet, um, Tembi's husband, Sato, had asked her to take a portion of his ashes and bring, bring them to Sicily. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah, That's so you were, quest. you were That's doing this in this private way because there, there's all this cultural uh, boundaries where you couldn't do it that oh, way. Right. So she's in the prologue, like climbing over fences and doing this in secret. And yeah, yeah. And that that whole sort of the, the quest piece. Mm -hmm. um, I took a great, right back to writing, I took a great class with Maureen Murdoch. I don't know if you know Sounds Maureen. very familiar, yeah. So she, anyway, she writes about like sort of, she she I did a workshop with her about the heroine's journey. Mm. I was reading Zoella's, my daughter's, um, books on mythology, you know, which all have to do with like these female heroines and da, 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 da. And, and one of them is set, you know, if we look at Persephone, right, that whole set, which is, you know, Sicily's called Persephone's Island. That's one of the sort of the- I so, did not yeah. know that. Yeah, like tech, yeah. So, so apparently, you know, Hades took her to Sicily, you know, she's in the underground in Sicily and that's, it's like, so in the mythology of Sicily, Demeter- and Persephone, bless you, are all very much, but that that idea of quest, right, and mythology, yes. and, and there's also all kinds of ruins all over the island of Sicily, so this whole idea of, like, mythology and quests, and Sato loved all the Homer, and he loved, you know, he loved the Odyssey, and so all of that, so I remember being in that car, right, and I am have this, bless you, bless you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's quite all right. I have this, you know, task at hand to... And I thought, oh my God, I am on a quest. Yes. And I have to do this kind of quickly. Yes. Because there's a time constraint. You know, I have to get back to town. And I, and, and that I knew was like, once I'd finished it, I didn't know as I was, as it was happening, but I thought about it the next day. I was like, that could be the beginning. And I knew that that was like, you know, I said, oh, I, because that was kind of the beginning of the, of the quest. Yes. You know, I had to release in order to get something. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! No, don't you don't have to stop yeah. talking. Are you kidding? I could listen to you for hours. So, uh, yeah. Can we talk about the kitchen widow? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Let's hear about that. Absolutely. Now, did that was that birthed before the novel? You yeah. started doing that several years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, So You were I already writing the novel at the time. Ish, but I didn't know yeah. I was writing a novel. Got it. Do you know what I mean? Got like it. I was sort of that. The kitchen widow really came about, and I can tell now. I can see in retrospect. You know, I didn't, in the moment, I was just doing what I felt, had the heartfelt, you know, sort of desire to do. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, hindsight gives you all of this perspective about your life. So I was I was on a plane coming back from Sicily, and I remember being in the Rome airport and chatting it up with someone as we were waiting to, you know, sort of get on the plane. And she was like, oh, where are you from? And I was, uh, she said, where are you coming from? It's Sicily. Where are you going? Ella, you know. And then she said, oh. And I said widow you know all the key sort and she said that's really interesting she goes you know i have um a friend whose husband has cancer what would you think i should say to her then you know um i'd be sometimes in all kinds of social situations and people would hear key aspects of my story you know in brief because you know you don't up, you don't you know sort of right. front load <laughs> <laughs> you know at a new meet and greet with right. hi i'm a widow cancer i mean yeah. front. they'll like flee the room right, right. <laughs> so but as those things would come forward, people would often ask advice. And I thought, maybe what I could do is if I could create some resource, something somewhere, use my storytelling skills, my skills as an actor, all those resources I know about being in front of the camera, and put it somewhere digitally where people could find it. So I thought I would like do one video and like have a, a landing page <laughs> of like resources. I don't know what I was, you know, and I called my friend who's a TV producer. I was like, well, and I knew I wanted to do something around food because I just come back from Sicily and I had literally had suitcases of food, which you'll learn about if those readers will learn about that in the book. But anyway, I had these suitcases of food. And so I got back to LA and I thought I was unpacking. I was like, maybe this somewhere in this is the story. Like I'll have some friends over and we'll just film ourselves talking around the dinner table. And that'll be like the video. So 
I literally started the end. I backdoored my way <laughs> into a whole <laughs> platform and advocacy piece that I didn't consciously know that's what I was mm. doing. Um, and so now, so I did, I think I did a total of like maybe five videos um, and there's resources there. There, are, There's some writing. There's a blog that I kind of put there and then I backed off of because I didn't know really how much I wanted to reveal in the space. It felt like it would not quite the format to contain the sort of expanse of the story, but right. it could do dip in and out of parts of it. And um, it became a tool that people found me. One of the best things that ever happened was my agent, my acting agent, got a call from someone in Arkansas who said, we would like a speaker to come to our conference. And we Googled art, grief, and food. They put those together in the search wow. engine. And guess Poop. who Tempe popped Luck. up? And the only person who popped <laughs> up was Timmy Luck. And so, you know, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, okay, well, that's the universe speaking. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'll go talk to those people. Because who puts three words in a search engine and only has one thing pop up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, incredible. and that they me. So, so the kitchen widow really is a my way of both. Um, at that point in my grief, was a way to kind of move forward and be expressive and do a give back as I tried to move forward. And I really did want to thank everyone who was a part of that long journey of caregiving. So the objective of the kitchen widow really is to provide a space for people to kind of think and talk about what it means to care for someone you love or a friend or a family member or a coworker or a colleague um, in a time that's a critical time. And illness, a life-altering illness is a critical time. And loss, in the immediate weeks, months, years <laughs> after someone passes, it's a critical time. And often we feel like, what do I do? What do I say? And since I started, there are many, you know, there's the conversation project, there's the the dinner, dinner partiers, I'm sure you know about them. Yes, and, you know, yeah. there's so many ways, but I think we're all hungry for that conversation. And for me, it felt very natural to do it through food because Sada was a chef. Yes. So The Kitchen Widow, I launched it, I put it out there, and then I was like, oh gosh, to maintain that whole thing is like a big thing. Yes. It's a lot, yes. it's a to-do. Yes. And so I've left it there as a calling card. And it's interesting now, it's kind of coming back. Yes. And I'm getting messages from people. And so now I'm thinking, hmm, I'm, what am I, what's going to be my new, and how am I going to grow that as well? Yeah. Because I think the book, People read the book and some find their way on that page to that site and they want to know more. Yeah. And so if you guys want to find that, it's thekitchenwidow.com and you can also find it through Tembi's personal website, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which has all about her book and yeah. her speaking engagements and her acting career. There's some fun, um, fun clips. little snippets Those of her clips. acting. I know. I know. I, I, you know, being an actor, I mean, it's such grace. It's so much fun. I mean, I know everybody sort of. It's like I'm an actor, and I'm like I love it. I've yeah. always loved being an actor. I mean, from I was when I was a kid, I was the kid who back in the old day, you know, I would like walk behind the TV and f try to figure out how people got in. Like my family has no, my family has these stories of me as like two and three. Like I would literally walk behind the looking like how did the people get in there? I want to get in there with them. So I feel blessed that I you know have made a career for myself. Yeah. You know, which is not an easy feat. Oh, please! Are you kidding me? I mean, the rejection, but, the reject, but, but it teaches you tenacity totally. And I think that's it's a theme. Only having known you for forty-five minutes, like I sense that that's a big part, and everything else that you've been through that gave you the moxie. Oh yeah, to say no, I, I'm actually, guys, I'm going to write this book, and I'm going to write it the way I want to write it. Yeah, because the creative piece. I mean, one of the things I have learned as an actor is that you've got to bring your vision for the character, f bring your vision first, then let the collaboration begin, right? Mm. So, and you gotta, you owe it to yourself as a creative person to follow that piece, your vision, with the idea that it will change, it can yeah. grow, it can expand, it can, you know, you don't hold, you know, if I don't show up at a rehearsal, like, this is how I'm gonna perform right. it. And right. everybody else step away. You know, what is that? That's <laughs> right. nothing. You know, I don't even know what that is, yeah. you know. Um, so I tried to approach, you know, so when I started writing the book with that in mind, like, okay, I'm gonna bring my best draft that I could possibly ever write to my editor, and then we'll start the process. Yeah. You know, and then she'll help me make it better, which is like what a director does, you know, on set. Right. 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 Your other actors, you know, that's the collaborative piece, right? So so now your book is out. Yeah. 
Yay! I know what happy a feeling dance. that is. It is such a happy. You you are already getting. I mean, we can't even. There's so many to list, but you're on Reese Witherspoon's. Okay. I mean, can you tell me about that? What was that like getting that phone call? Okay, that Corinne kept saying she couldn't tell me what it was. She's like, "Oh my god, okay." But when you interview her, she's already going to have this news. It's going to be really exciting. I could feel her like jumping up and down on the other end. Oh my gosh! Okay, first of all, Reese is what she is doing around women's stories. Okay, at the print level of the printed page, yes. through it being you know digitally on yes. screens wherever. But this, what she's doing with the book club. So when she released that message saying that the book, I think she said, it gives me all the feels. Oh, <laughs> it does. It gives me she all said the feels. Like, That's exactly what I was what like, it does. you don't understand. I played that. I was like, it was surreal. Like Reese sure. holding a picture of a book I wrote saying my name. It was, it was a surreal moment. And the best story was my, I, Screen, took a screenshot of it, sent it to my sister-in-law in in Sicily. And I was waiting to hear back from her, like through WhatsApp, you know, I'm like, why is she taking so long to get back to me? You're like, what? So like a half hour later, she texts me, she goes, oh, I was sorry, we were in mass, we were at church. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> she goes, I came out, she goes, and I showed it to Nonna, who's my mother-in-law. Yeah. And my mother-in-law looked at the picture, she goes, Who's that lady holding a picture of my hysterical, son? Hysterical. Hysterical. So who's that lady hysterical. holding a picture of my I mean, she didn't say it with that accent because she said it in Sicilian. But the point is- But I if was, she were American, Italian, that's, that's, that's exactly how she, how she would sound. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Right. She, she would sound like not. Cher and Moose Exactly. There you go. Exactly. It's like the worst thing. Else. And by the way, that in the writing, holding the Sicilian, the Italian, and the English all simultaneously, not easy. And my copy editor wanted to kill me. And yet- reading it now, it's just, again, like it's so seamless. I never once have stopped and gone, and I'm on page about 160 now. It's like 300 pages. Mm -hmm. I've never once gone, wait, where am I? I'm confused. Never once. Oh, perfect. Perfect. It's that seamless. was really, okay, thank you. Oh, we worked, I worked really hard to to, yeah. to to be able to. To make it look easy. Yeah, yeah. You worked to hard make, to make it look, it look easy. easy. Yeah. So, so Reese is holding your book. So you're like, <laughs> and you're like right now doing book tours and you're yeah. going tonight to a place in Pasadena yes. to do a reading. Yes. And yes. what does that feel like? It's all wonderful. This is the, sh my sister reminded me, my sister's a novelist. And so she's been down this road before and she's on her, her fifth book comes out in September. So she is my. She's my little sister, but she's my big sister in terms of like book world and literary things and all things literary. So I said to her, she goes, Tembi, okay, let's just break this shit down. She was like, that's the way she, you Where does she live? She lives right nearby here. She's, oh, the, she's in Glassell Park. Yeah. Oh, so she good. says to me, she says, okay, the hardest part is done. You lived it. Mm. Then you wrote about it. Now you just get to share it. Mm. And that reminder was so beautiful. Mm. So tonight when I get to go out and see people sort of like hold the book up or ask me to sign it or or if they have read a bit, share something. And and the shares also the ways in which the story has so much, um, you know, the, the catchphrase, you know, intersectionality around so many things. Yes. But there is, there's a lot of, inter the, the book has lots of points of intersection, you know. Around culture, language, food, geography, family, you know, family biology, biology, all yeah. of it, all race, of, race, all, all of things, it is yeah. in there while we're eating pasta. Yes. <laughs> it's all there. And handmade so, pasta. Handmade pasta. So what's interesting is seeing, you know, people come up to me and the parts of the story that most resonate with them. Yeah. Right. And um, one of the most beautiful things someone said to me was she was like, I read your book. And she said, and I loved it. She goes, but I have a question. She was like, that town in East Texas, I don't know if you're there yet. I won't give anything away. But I thought to myself, okay, I kind of love right now the fact that in a book about love in Sicily, she's, she's having to wrestle with this Texas. question. She's having to wrestle with this question, right? And that is like the fun of it is knowing like what, each sure. reader plugs into. Sure. But because you were so specific in each of those elements, mm. that's what makes it universal. Well, the specificity, I have to say, as a writer, I crib a lot of that off my as an actor. Like as an actor, a part of my my job is to bring specificity to that character. How does mm. that character hold that cup? How does that character walk? How does that character, you know, does it chew gum? 
Do they pick their teeth? You know, all of that, all of those specific human behaviors, yeah. I think, um, you know, when I would get stuck in the writing, sometimes I would do a whole exercise, which is what I would do as an actor, where I would just write like two pages about how this character, let's say, would walk through a mall, mm. you know, or mm -hmm. be at the store. Now, in this case, they're real people. So I've observed them for 20 plus right. years or whatever. So I kind I know what, it, but like, I wanted to bring those things to the reader. Yeah. You know, so. I could talk to you for hours, but we have come to the time. Oh, we have? I, girl, we've been talking for 56 minutes. I mean, Shooting. with a brief break for yeah, you okay. to get me a yeah, box of, still, okay. of tissue. Well, and okay. the cat fart in between. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. So um, let's see. So I'm going to ask you three questions okay. that I ask every okay. mom I'd like to follow who comes on the show. Here's to all moms. All moms. Here's to all moms. All moms. In all of our forms, in all of our beauty, our flaws. <laughs> it's a damn hard job. <laughs> and it's just... I don't know. And I just, I really, yeah, I've been having trouble. You know, my son hasn't been wanting to go to school and he's tired in the morning. And um, I'm just like, I'm like, well, I want to do it right. I want to hold space for his emotion and his, the reality of his experience. And yet, dude, you're going to school. You know what I mean? It's no, really hard absolutely. to balance that. Yeah. One of the best things a preschool teacher told me was she said, give them a hundred percent of your attention, 50% of the time. Uh, and that was so freeing. Wow, that's the toddler really because good. the toddler was like every Constant. she's cry every cry I have yeah. to every event. And I've at different junctures in her development, I've circled back to that. I need to give this moment a hundred percent of my time, but I can't give every moment of my life. Yes, you know everything can't be a hundred percent all the time. Yes, and that that's that's freeing. That is gold. So I wish if I would that have heard helps that. any that mom helps out there. That helps me. That you know, helps, but yeah. when I'm in, when it's that fifty that I'm I'm hundred percent yeah. in. Yeah, you know, and they feel that. Yeah, and then I can you know some days I'm going to be doing something else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's good modeling for her. I think so. You know. Yeah. All right. Oh goodness, I'm putting my seatbelt on, yes. or should I take it off? I don't know. <laughs> What do you think about Tembi when you hear the word MILF? Well, you know what I think. Fucking. <laughs> Lots of fucking. I'm all about the fucking. Oh, God, I can't believe I just said that. Yes. So just get up in there. I mean, every minute. I don't think I could love you more. And then something magical happens. I, I go right there. I love it. I love it. I start thinking, MILF, fuck. I go, MILF, <laughs> MILF, fuck. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Okay. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Oh, um, flavored almonds. <laughs> okay, say more. Okay, I tend to be a purist about things. Okay, like but I like wait a minute, because yeah. I just discovered the dill pickle almonds at Whole Foods. Are Stop these it, of sister. which you speak? Well, okay, that would fall into the category, <laughs> but see, now that I'm, I have opened my heart up and my soul up to the flavored almond, I'm going to have to hit that aisle at Whole Foods. Is it? See, I like a dill pickle. I like that. So I might be in for that. I will I will text well, you. What kind you. of flavored almonds do you pretty much enjoy? now I'm into the mesquite, the smoke, the barbecue. Oh, yeah. I'm into it all, the chipotle. I mean, I'm like, what the hell? I've become like throw the flavor on it. And well, because go. here's the thing. I'm such a chip fanatic. Like I love chips, but it's really not good for you. Yeah, but the almonds you feel like you could You feel do like that. you're getting a little you're getting that salty, tangy, totally. savory. Totally. And you get the protein. And the protein. Yep. How do you define success? Oh. Success is feeling though you gave it your best. That's it. Mm. That's it. It's not about any outcome. Mm. <clears throat> Success to me is actually being able to show up for the process willingly and openly. And then you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Um, we don't, none of us knows what's going to happen. That's one thing I am totally sure of. <laughs> yeah. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So, but we can. So to me, to be successful is to show up in all of our full glory to the best of our ability mm. in that given moment and see what happens. I just, as you were speaking, I just got a flash of the scene where you just met Sato and you hadn't, he was obviously very much into you and you were like, sure, I'll come have dinner. I'll bring my friends. And you describe it beautifully in your writing. I'm paraphrasing that uh, he basically made love to you 
with the food that he had brought out to the table that he created. And it was just like, again, like that was again, I watched you guys falling in love again. Mm -hmm. And I watched your character, Mm -hmm, you in the book, mm -hmm. soften to that. And it was just so romantic and artistic and loving and... Yeah, that's, 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 I know. I'm sorry. I'm gushing so much, no. but I'm just like fresh off it. And it's, 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 like, it's well, just and it's amazing. also nice to see Sato come to life oh. in the heart and mind of another person. He keeps. I mean, in some way, I'm. I realized recently. I was like, I get to have him all over again in another kind of way, and that is something I didn't. I didn't set out to do that. I didn't right. know that that could even be possible. Mm. But he's coming back to me, and sometimes we sit and we cry together because mm. I'll. You know, I've been doing that also during this time. But also mostly it's us, me going, can you believe? Mm. Can you believe? Thank Mm. you. You're a remarkable woman. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'm just blown away by you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to segue into some silly, fun, lightning round questions. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? The potato chip. (laughs) Do they? I don't actually consider pizza junk food unless it comes from Domino's. Uh, no slight against Domino, you know it, but you right. know, like you can make a healthy pizza. Like a pizza doesn't have to be junk. F- Some people consider that junk food. So I couldn't put. I love pizza though. That- now, do you make pasta from scratch now? I don't, because that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work I've tried no, doing it, and if no, you're not born like no, you're into not, that, no, no, and if you're also not on, on doing it on the regular, it, no, no, I don't. Because I tried doing it and it it was bad. Yeah, no, 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 no. and that's why they have artisanal people who do that. You know, and I get that. Yeah, at at uh, Whole Foods and those places. Yeah, so potato chips are my like mm. oh, potato chips. What's your favorite kind? Oh, oh, I I'm I'm an equal opportunity oh, potato chip consumer, but I do like cracked uh, black pepper and oh, salt. Yeah. Right. I can get I'm down a with sour the, cream can, and onion girl. You know, I can get down with that, okay. but I'm more into like the barbecue-y barbecue kind of like, you know, uh, okay. mm-hmm. mesquite, totally. chipotle. Those that's are the, the things Texas you mentioned part, yep. for the. Yeah, well, I'm there it. again. Yeah, that's all right. the, that's my flavor palette right there. Movies or Broadway show? Yeah, unless it's Hamilton movie. Oh, gosh. So amazing. I've only seen it once here at the Pantages, but I, I was on the edge of my seat. I actually saw it with Kim. Yeah. Our, I took Zoella to see it. Oh. Yeah, our mutual friend, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Hamilton. I saw it, yeah. But no, new movies. I, lo- I love a good movie. Daytime sex or nighttime sex? I think I know your answer. All the time. That's right. <laughs> that's right. All the time. <laughs> Texting or talking? Talking. Mm. Talking. Unless you do, unless you write like a long text. Right. Right? Because there are people, like sometimes I will sit, my friends make fun of me that I write very long texts. But I do think of them as like a little bit of a letter. Yeah. So, yeah. I love that. Cat person or dog person? Animal person. Yes. Have you ever worn a unitard? Sister, maybe back in 82 for like a school project. Didn't we all? <laughs> oh, God. I hated those things. One, they were not made for my type of body They're back in the day. They're not made for anybody's okay, body. Well, I, they, you're, you're like long, elegant, lean. Da, da, da. I was like. I was like, just to get it over the curvy bottom half, then there was nothing to do with the top half. I was like, where the fuck did the material go? I hated those things. They're terrible. They're making a comeback, you know. Ladies, ladies, let me do you a favor. Let me do you a favor. Stay away from the tard. <laughs> Stay away from the from the leotard, unitard, any of the tards. Just be in clothes. Just, you know, have a seam. Wear some, Have some structure. Wear some aloe, aloe, lega, aloe yoga leggings or, or Lululemon or whatever yeah, it's called. I mean, yeah, leggings. The day you see me in a legging, I mean, not a legging, a unitard, <laughs> is the day you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know I've gone bad. She's crazy. <laughs> You'll know it's too much for Tembi. Somebody <laughs> help her sit down somewhere in a corner. Shower or bathtub? I love a bathtub. Mm. I really do. And I, I, I've come to really love those. My mother, and my, my stepmother, actually, when she was staying here after Sato passed, she would run a bath for me mm. just to, as a soothing thing. And that's a part of what I talk about in The Kitchen Widow is that sort of art of comfort. Like, what is the art of comfort? There's an art to mm. it. I think it's a, there's a lost art. And we're trying to sort of reclaim, how do we know how to comfort each other? And sometimes it's a, something as simple as, I see you have this need. 
I'm going to run a bath or make a cup of tea for you. Yeah. You know, those simple gestures that say care. Yeah. And I have not stopped taking baths since. I mm. love taking baths now. And they kind of are my way to decompress. And actually, they were part of my writing process. Interesting. How so? Well, when I would get stuck, sometimes I'd just go run a bath yeah. and light a candle and be like, let me just shake it off. And with something about being in the water yeah. and soothing and just kind of being vulnerable. Yeah. You know, I hadn't thought of this until just now, but that vulnerability of yeah. like, taking everything off, yeah, you know, and getting back into one of like the primary elements, mm. water. And just, so yeah, I used it in my writing process to kind of clear away the cobwebs. I love that. I love that. I'm going to borrow that. I'm a big bath yeah. taker. Ice cream or chocolate? I like chocolate. Yeah, I you like said that. I was thinking so earnestly and sincerely, <laughs> almost as if you were afraid of hurting ice cream. Well, I feelings. do because I do love. Well, because I do love gelato. My daughter is a gelato. You know, we love. We eat a lot of gelato, but sometimes the like I can eat chocolate any time of year. Gelato. I have to say, I'm not into ice cream in the winter. I don't like the cold on cold yeah. thing. Yeah, like I really like ice cream in the summer. Yeah, but chocolate anytime. It's all the time. That's it's right. Ever, it's it's evergreen, but not green. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? <laughs> Is the scale going to the negative numbers? <laughs> negative five? Oh, gosh. No. No. I have the worst hand eye coordination. The worst. No, no. Like the worst hand coordination. I actually asked my mom. I know back in my, in like the 70s when I was a kid, you know, they used to put people in the play pens. Yes. I actually am convinced that some of my motor skills did not develop because I was not allowed to crawl around on the floor. Like, I actually think I would have better hand-eye coordination if I not, had not been just- In the playpen. In the playpen, just staring. Now, I can think and stare but at that's things probably what observe. made you a great writer, <laughs> probably, right? Because I couldn't Because you had to go to your mind. <laughs> you were just like this Zen baby in the playpen, so. like imagining these <laughs> with no, stories. With no gross motor skills. No gross motor skills. <laughs> She's just a brain and a blob. <laughs> What's your biggest pet peeve? Oh, oh, um... Ah, uh, gosh, I have so many. <laughs> I do, I do. I have so many. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, you need everybody in my life to answer these. Um, um, I don't, okay, I absolutely cannot stand. I can see my body's like I'm twitching. I hate plastic cutlery. No, 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 you don't understand. Like, I would rather eat with my hands. <laughs> I would rather like lick the plate. It's something about plastic cutlery. It just feels it's terrible. It's terro like it, it, like from a, at my path, like, it's just awful. Like it feels at, awful in my hand. It it's feels awful in my like mouth. It doesn't looking hold the at food. Tembi right now, friends, it's like she's talking about maggots crawling all over her body. That's how intensely she loathes plastic cutlery. I do. I hate I it. it. I hate it. I carry people, you know. Yeah, no, I know. That's so stupid. But if yeah. you could push a button and it would create 10 years of world peace, but mm -hmm. it would also place a 100-year ban on all beauty products, would you push it? I, we would get 10 years of world peace. Yeah. But there would be no aesthetic beauty. Products. Products. For 100 years. For 100 years. Yeah. Well, Not a great deal. No, but ladies... <laughs> You're going to look rough for about 100 years. <laughs> then you can get your pretty on again. But I'm going to need those 10 years of peace. I am living through Trump right now yep. at the very same time that I have a teenager. Oh. So I am doing the Trump and adolescent years concurrently. Wow. So, yeah, no, I need a little bit of peace. <laughs> world peace. I love world peace. Yes. So we're going to have to just roll rough. Yeah, that's right. With like bad skin yeah. and... We'll just for, make the for, beauty products from nature. We sure will. We can do that. We're resourceful. We are. We are. We are women. We are mothers. We are mothers that I like to follow. That's right. That's right. That's who we are. Anytime, anywhere. Anytime, anywhere. All day. All day. With almonds. <laughs> Maybe before, after, or during. Who knows? <laughs> Superpower choice. Okay. Invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength. Um, super strength. I don't want to be, uh, invisibility doesn't interest me. I think so, so, so much about being a woman and being a woman of color and just in the world is about visibility. Like the idea of being invisible. I think I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I think my whole people, my tribe, all of womanhood, we've been doing that for a while. Like, yeah, yeah I don't need to be invisible. Yeah. <laughs> visibility, 
the superpower. Like what? Yeah. Whatever that would mean to me, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Like, you would yeah. make it your own. I'd make it my own. I think yeah. I want that. I love it. I want that. I love it. Let our superpower be love. Would you rather have a penis where your tailbone is? Oh, stop, sister! Stop the madness! I can't even or wrap my, my mind around that one. A third eye. Well, I don't want a penis. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that it would be on my tailbone, I'd be sitting on it all the time. So, nah, 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 no. I'll, I'll get with the penis in a different way. Okay. Right? <laughs> penis and I will find each other in a different way. I want the third, third eye. eye. Third eye. What was the name of your first pet? TCO. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Dalton. So your poor name is TCO Dalton. Baby, that is me. Bring on the pole. I mean, she no. is <laughs> TCO Dalton. She's she's from Texas. <laughs> she is so from Texas. She is totally from Texas. She is like, TCO. she's up there with a cowboy hat and cowgirl <laughs> boots and fringe. Oh my gosh. And then when she's done, she will count up her cash <laughs> and she'll say, get the fuck out of here. That's right. <laughs> that's that's right. That's I'm right. done. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. This Tembi, is you're so amazing. Fun. Oh, this is you're so just amazing. fun. Thank we you. have to Thank do this more. Is fun. We will do more. Okay. We will definitely do more, Jennifer. This has been such an honor. You are my first podcast. Oh, like, I love this. I'm so honored. Everybody's going to have to measure up to you now. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's going to be a challenge or a <laughs> no. They've got to, they've got to, they've got to bring the warm, the fun. They've got to bring it the way you brought it. Well, thank so thank you. you. It's an honor. And if people want to find you, yeah. <clears throat> what is your website? Tembylock dot com, and that's L O C K E. Yes, and then um, and, and all of this will be on my show notes yes. at milfpodcast dot okay. com. But your Instagram handle it is tembylock. Okay. Same thing with Twitter okay. and same thing with Facebook. You awesome. can find me there or you can go to the Kitchen Widow, but find me at 10B Law. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Tembi. you, everybody. Woo-hoo. Yay. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope that you enjoyed my interview with Tembi and that you'll go pick up her book or order it on Amazon. Treat yourself. Trust me, you will thank me. Join me next week when I bring Kathy Ladman onto the show. Kathy is a stand-up comedian and a writer. She's wonderful, and I'm really excited to share that interview with you. Also, just a reminder, pick up your tickets for the live event. Don't wait. MILFpodcast.com or DynastyTypewriter.com for the MILF Podcast live event in July. I love you guys. Keep going. Keep going.